Hello, everybody, and I hope you have had a good time so far here. Um, so yesterday or today, we have been hearing something about sustainable development, the importance of sustainable development in making INDC. So I take that note and uh, start my presentation, which I'm going to cover this aspect of INDC. So the title is Aligning Climate Actions with Sustainable Development. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about uh, is, uh, first of all, objective of INDC, introduction to sustainable development, definition mainly, a step to make INDC, and synergy and trade-off between climate uh, change actions and uh, sus uh, sustainable development goals and national development. And then I narrowed down my presentation to agriculture sector and uh, talking a little bit about its uh, priority sector in most of the national communication uh, reports and uh, the impact of climate change on agriculture, synergy between adaptation and mitigation policy, and then um, going to uh, three country, um, looking at the ongoing development project and to what extent they have contribution to mitigation and adaptation and align with sustainable development. So the key priority of INDC for developing countries is to align their climate change action with sustainable development. The starting point for developing INDC is medium to long term sustainable development plan and a strategy. So bear with me, I'm going to just saying sustainable development, sustainable development during this presentation. So uh, the presentation will show how to identify the actions that could make less greenhouse gas intensive or more resilience to climate change. I'm going to be talking about agriculture, and my colleague Suniba will be talking about energy, and Garrett um, will be talking about water. So the most quoted definition of uh, sustainable development is by World Commission on Environment and Development in 1987, saying that uh, sustainable development is a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. So it has two content, two key concepts. First is the, the con uh, concept of needs, in particular the essential needs of the world poor to which overriding priority should be given, and that's obvious, and the, ideal, the idea of limitation imposed by the sector of technology, social organization and the environmental ability to meet present and future need. So the key question is that, is it possible to develop a global strategy for controlling climate change that would simultaneously help to achieve sustainable development goals, for example, alleviate world pro uh, poverty, or is there a necessary trade-off between these goals? So this is the sustainable development taxonomy. It has three pillars of environment, environmental, social, and economical. And each of them, they have their own category, as you as you can see here. Sorry. No. Yep. And each of the category uh, has um, its own indicator. So this is useful tool when you want to know to, to what extent your action has a contribution to sustainable development. And the next step of this is going to that taxonomy and starting quantifying those benefits you can get from sustainable development contribution. And this is uh, sustainable development goal, which I'm sure mm, all of you are familiar with that. So it's by UN in 2040 and uh, so far, and the final decision will be taken during 2015 about this goal. So the main or the, the first goal is uh, poverty reduction uh, as saying that the, the first goal of sustainable development. So the point is that a subset of possible action can contribute to more than one goal, and some action can contribute to all if properly designed. So looking for synergies, looking for st those policy, they provide us synergy. At the same time, we can have a contribution to different goal is the important note. So in this figure, you can see this climate change action, uh, mitigation and adoption, they have 
also synergy with, with each other, with sustainable development goal, and with national development goals. And the higher um, the color is that, so the, um, the higher priority, the darker the uh, color, the higher the priority you can see. So in the next slide, I'm gonna be talking about the linkage between climate change actions, uh, which uh, decision maker um, sometimes facing. So uh, we have two types of uh, linkage. Sometimes because of the financial or other constraint, um, they should make a trade-off. So they cannot do both at the same time. And uh, But sometimes if they go for synergy, if they find a synergy, if they try to find synergies so they can have like a combined action which the um, effect is greater than the sum of each one separately. So in the next slide, I'll show you some of the example of those action which have a positive contribution to mitigation and also in adaptation at the same time. For example, for reforestation with native and uh, diverse tree species, so we can have a contribution to mitigation by carbon storage and also to adaptation by habitat and species protection, flood control, soil preservation, and the same uh, with for example, I'm gonna pick some of them because of the time and scarcity. Um, energy demand management, so reducing energy use and energy related greenhouse gas emission, which is a positive uh, mitigation uh, action and also cost saving, which is like adaptation action as well. So this, is, this slide shows the ideal framework for making INDC. So as uh, Denise mentioned, um, is a starting point is looking at national development plan. So the point is that national development plan should be aligned with sustainable development. If it's not, try to find a way to make it align together. And then looking at or defining climate change relevant policy, low carbon development policy or national climate change policy, and identifying uh, greenhouse gas intensive sector for example, agriculture, energy, or um, other sector. Uh, so then identification of measurement and action uh, regarding those um, sector by using some instrument, for example, NAMA, um, to get the result of reducing greenhouse gas emission and adaptation to climate change. So if all those um, uh, framework is done, so it's helpful and uh, we can use to measure baseline, baseline scenario. So um, what we, we will be talking uh, in this afternoon is about GASMA model, uh, which based on um, uh, abatement cost, uh, which, which is helpful uh, tool uh, to measure baseline in each sector and also like a general baseline. So as I, as I said before, so I'm gonna be talking about from now on about agriculture. Agriculture is one of the main vulnerable sectors. The main vulnerability in agriculture sector affiliated to weather and price fluctuation. So you know that. So farmers are vulnerable to recurrent drought event, flood, soil degradation, water supply shortage, Farmers are vulnerable because of the limitation availability of input and improved seed, few technology, limited infrastructure, and ac access to market. So climate change itself will increase uncertainty and enhance vulnerability as well. And also the high dependency, uh, reliance to rainfall also in another point in agriculture. But also agriculture is the main uh, or like one of the uh, priority sector for most country because it's contribution to GDP and um, also is like it's very important in reducing rural poverty in different country this is like some of the results from national communication I put here so for agriculture um, we have different adaptation and mitigation um, policies. So those policy I'll show you, uh, I've been reading the recent national policy for countries and those are like policy I could find similar uh, over uh, countries. So this is like adaptation policies, crop management, adjustment, for example, crop diversification initiative, 
is uh, one of the action, livestock management adjustment, irrigation optimization, water management, and uh, so on. And this is also for mitigation policy, uh, crop farming system management, fertilizer, soil management, and animal husbandry um, are mitig possible mitigation action for climate change. So the point is that looking at those po um, policies and action and find which one you can take, which has contribution to the other one. So like finding synergy mainly. And this, is, uh, this slide is about showing that, so some of those mitigation action uh, has a contribution to sustainable development and to what extent they have contribution to each pillar of sustainable development. As I showed you in sustainable development taxonomy, we have social, economic, and environmental uh, pillar. So for example, for water management, we have positive contribution to social aspect, economic aspect, and environmental aspect. And also for grazing land management, we have positive for these three pillars. So it means that contribution to sustainable development for this action is high. So it's, it's helpful when we want to make a decision between different action in terms of uh, contribution to sustainable development. So if you go in this way, you see that you can rank it. So of course, you need to know this is at the country level. So it's very much depend on which country you are. So is the context and location specific. So it's better to start from the country. So as I promised, um, I'm gonna be talking about the um, development, ongoing development, national development project in countries. So which are aligned with sustainable development and to see if they have a contribution to mitigation and adaptation and they could be a potential for INDC. So the country, Kyrgyzstan, Colombia, Cambodia, sorry, and Mozambique, for example, one case in Kyrgyzstan uh, I came across is uh, organic uh, cotton production and uh, trade promotion in Kyrgyzstan, which is, um, is um, the idea, the goal is organic farming. So organic farming has a contribution to both aspects of uh, mitigation and adaptation. And um, this is for adaptation, for agriculture, and for, for example, for waste and water, um, solid waste um, project, which had also positive contribution to both aspects. And also for energy part, sustainable charcoal production uh, from renewable energy I, uh, I saw that, so this also, um, the goal is reducing deforestation, providing sustainable alternative, turfeed, uh, turf charcoal, uh, and uh, from renewable biomass source. So it has both mitigation and adaptation uh, contribution. So the conclusion is in INDC preparation, again, sustainable development goal should be the overriding fr framework to prioritize mitigation and adaptation action. Therefore, climate change action will only be sensible to the extent that they are compatible with those goals. A number of measures can be expected to provide synergy among mitigation and adaptation, and please give the priority to those mitigation action. They have a contribution already in adaptation action and um, adaptation action, which they have a um, contribution to mitigation actions. And another point is that in preparation of INDC, sustainable development dimension will be better achieved if the environmental gains are better acknowledged, quantify, and incorporate in the decision-making framework. So the point is that um, most of the time, because we don't quantify the benef environmental benefit, so we don't really take them into account. Um, I've heard from one of you that like, looking for like a way to convince some of the policy maker saying that instead of charcoal, instead of coal, we want renewable energy. So if you go to this direction of quantification of those environmental benefit, then you come up with a number, then you can actually discuss based on that number, which is acceptable most of the time, which works for policy makers. And thank you for attention. That's it. Thank you, uh, Fatima, for that 
one, six, uh, limiting it to within 15 minutes, and also a very nice overview of how essentially to anchor uh, the identification of actions within the larger sustainable development framework, which I mentioned earlier about the ownership, as well as uh, seeing synergies between mitigation and adaptation that can enhance uh, the ownership and uh, feasibility of implementing those actions. Uh, we have our second speaker now, uh, Suniva, who is going to talk about how to identify and prioritize mitigation opportunities, and she'll be taking an example uh, to highlight uh, the aspect of uh, saying that where are the sectors where you have higher level of emissions, uh, larger contribution to sustainable development, and how could then mitigation within this context uh, be identified and implemented. Suniva, over to you, and uh, with the request, if we can keep it to 15 minutes. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll try my best to do this briefly. So if something seems shallow or you want more information, catch me in the coffee break instead. Um, okay. Right. So I wanted to start by showing you this slide. Some of you may have seen it before, I assume. But I want you to try and imagine just for a second how this looks in your countries. This is the world, and it shows you the share of emissions based on sectors, the activities that they are used for, but also in terms of the gases that are being emitted in the end. As you see, energy is of one of the really big proportions. And within that, we have some pretty clear distributions between transport, electricity, fuel combustion and industry, and of course, fugitive emissions. So imagine for a second how this distribution is within your own countries and how it has been changing over time and how it is likely to be changing in the future. Um, as you can see, the total emissions, or you can't see, has actually been changing uh, and increasing 12.7% since 2000 until 2005. That's at about 2.4% per year. The sector growth, however, has been varying between 40% and 0%, which shows you that some of them are more explosive than others. And again, I encourage you to think about how this fits and aligns with your countries. Ask yourself also, where is the demand coming from? And to what extent is it possible for us to manage this demand? In terms of identifying what the mitigation opportunities are in your countries, there are some parameters you need to take into consideration. Fatima has already been talking a lot about the national objectives and the priorities, but consider also the GHG, GHG inventories you've already created, what profiles you have. Consider the assessment of your reduction potential, your capacity to make that assessment. Consider what prioritization process you want to have and what level of stakeholder inclusion you want to have in that process. And finally, and very importantly also, be sure to consider the strategy for implementation and the capacity you have for implementing the plans that you come up with. Um, yes. In terms of this, we're going to be talking a lot more in the course of this workshop, and you will expose to plenty of talks about both models and methodologies. They'll be available, and so I won't be covering them a lot, just in plus 15 minutes, so we'll try and make it a bit brief. Instead, I want to talk a bit about the parameters for making your decisions. These are sort of the baseline start here. Consider, first of all, what is the potential for reduction in emission growth in your countries? Which sectors can result in co-benefits? Are there already any existing opportunities that have been identified um, and any existing mitigation plans to work with? It's really important here to consider the level of ambition you want to take. I know one of the INDC points is the idea of having an ambitious, an ambition level that speaks towards the ultimate goal of the convention, but you also have to remember that the commission commitments should be reflecting your national circumstances. Moving on up, you have more questions about which sectors can benefit from higher mitigation ambition which sectors have the available information on costs and benefits, and of course, which international initiatives have you already been ratifying and applying in your countries, and to what extent are they applicable in terms of the INDC process. And finally, if you want to step it up further, we have this question of the potential for enhanced potential reduction in the emission growth. Which sectors could benefit personally, or not personally, sector-wise, from having more ambitious action in terms of your development strategies, um, and which actions and goals have political and economic support within the country. Of course, this requires that you have access to a certain level of data, a certain level of economic potential, but also a certain level of sector knowledge. So consider here carefully what the political feasibility for implementation is, and consider what sort of institutional background you have for conducting these assessments. Moving on to two cases in particular, we were introduced briefly to Cambodia and to Kyrgyzstan. Um, if you're looking at the GHG inventory, the world share of emissions for both of these countries is quite low. And I imagine many of you feel the same way when you're looking at your own emissions. 
Uh, the data used here is from the inventory of 1994 from Cambodia and 2005 for Kyrgyzstan. Um, since the share is quite small, it really underlines the fact that the INDC is an opportunity to support the existing development initiatives that are taking place in your countries. If we look then specifically at the sector distribution, and I promise to talk a bit about energy here, this is Cambodia's, and you see energy is actually quite a small section. However, this is largely to do with the fact that a lot of the Cambodian economy at the time was based on fuel wood, and which is not included in this calculation. So you see also for that reason that the land use in forestry has been, is quite a tremendous portion. Um, yes, in recent times it seems that Cambodia is more likely to be going from being a sort of carbon sink towards becoming an emitter. And that's also one of the reasons why it's really important to make sure that your data is current and that you're basing your plans on realistic information sources. If we look instead at Kyrgyzstan, here we have a different picture where you see the energy is by far the majority of the sector. Um, yes, and we have a large energy consumption. Splitting it up more in the energy distribution, we have a pretty clear picture that for both countries, a large portion of the energy is actually going to transport. If you remember the first slide I showed you, which showed you the distribution of energy sectors, transport actually on the world average only constitutes about 14.3% of emission share. But of this, you'll see that the CO2 consumption is about 23 to 25% globally. Um, so actually for both of these countries, it's quite high. The important thing to consider also is how is this demand going to change? For many of you, you may not currently be feeling that a sector like transport is the most prominent one. But I think most will find that as your economy starts to grow, the transport sector grows with it. This is also why it's really important to talk about projections and changing situations. This is the LEAP model projection for the energy sector in Cambodia. And it's very important here to notice that the transport sector has vastly increased. This is percentage on the side, sorry, that thing has disappeared. But transport is slowly starting to take over most of what the energy sector is actually contributing. So this is a real opportunity for making sure that you are creating both short and long-term reduction plans. Um, we talk about in transport planning, vision-based planning. And this is an opportunity to start considering how your strategies are integrated and how you are able to create a more holistic planning where these things are tied together because it will affect your economic growth. In Cambodia, the transport um, strategy has um, been, it's been experiencing an 8% increase in, registr uh, in registered vehicles between 2011 and 2012, which is pretty explosive and not unlike many other countries that are similar to it. We have current policies which deal mostly with rural road strategies, with rail railway transport strategies and things like that. However, the real consequence is that you are in a situation where you're implementing large immovable infrastructures rather than putting in sort of social policies which are able to affect positive change. Once you start to implement transport strategies like roads, things like that, it's going to be very difficult to start extracting them again. Um, this means that you are in a position now to mitigate the path dependency that you're putting in, and this counts also for other sectors. Rather than locking yourself into one technology, you're able to move towards others. Right. Okay, then we talk a little bit back to what the alignment with national strategies. This is when it becomes important to consider the prioritizations you're making. To have an idea about what the technical and political feasibility is going to be in your countries, what costs they're going to be, what the interlinkages you have with sustainable development, and what magnitude of emissions each of the sectors is experiencing. You also have to be very considerate in terms of the way you are making the prioritization decisions. There's a lot of methods for inclusion, a lot of methods for making uh, decisions that are incorporating um, various perspectives. You have the multi-criteria analysis, which some of you are sure to have heard about and will probably hear more about in the course of this period, where you're able to implement different um, indicators based on your sustainable development targets and see where they align and how they are able to live up to the different INDC standards. There are different levels of in stakeholder inclusion that you can have throughout the political process, both in discussing what these criteria should be and how they should be weighted. And then you have also different ranking methodologies to figure out which are more important to different stakeholders and the political community. In the UN transport strategies, we talk about for low carbon transport, especially this concept of avoid, shift, and improve. And I think this is the really important thing when we talk about goals and actions for the INDCs. 
In Kyrgyzstan, we have a situation at the moment where you have significant degradation of infrastructure due to low economic prioritization. Meanwhile, you have a passenger and cargo increasing with 10% each year. The goal, therefore, is at the moment to improve access of population to markets for goods and services. The degradation of the, of the road system is something that's very hard to deal with and has currently been resolved through loans. What you have to ask yourself, then, is with these actions that have been identified by Kyrgyzstan, which deal with creating more motorways for international transport corridors, preservation of hard surface roads, transport independence, railroads, how these INDC goals can be, made, can be used to be made more sustainable. How can we make sure that these goals are consistent, and that they live up to both short-term and long-term transport goals? In the short term, we're looking at upgrading of the vehicle fleet. We're looking at policy measures to incorporate that that deal with development of services as well as public and private mechanisms. Um, one of the things that they're talking about in Kyrgyzstan, for example, to resolve this passenger and cargo increasing, which is wearing and tearing the roads even more, is to make sure that you are putting some of the cargo onto the railroad system instead so that you are decreasing the effects felt on the roads. Yeah. And that was <laughs> my very brief, speedy 15 minutes. Um, yeah, sorry, that became a bit brief and a bit uh, quickly put through. Yep. Thank you, Suniva. Uh, <coughs> uh, we will hold on to the questions for a little while. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Gareth James Lloyd, and uh, I work at UNEP DHI Center, which is a UNEP collaborating center, which specializes in uh, water resource issues uh, and the environment. And uh, I've been invited uh, here today to, uh, to say a few words about uh, water resources in the uh, coastal and inland context um, to help you uh, in your thoughts and the processes in formulating your uh, INDCs. Uh, what I'll start by doing is uh, setting um, water in uh, context and then going into a little bit more detail, but uh, let's begin. So basically, uh, I, I like this figure here. It shows the largest sphere you can see uh, is representative of all the water on Earth. That's all the oceans, everything that's locked in the ice caps, all groundwater. That's, that's that uh, largest ball there out of the three. The second one is all fresh water in groundwater, lakes, swamps, and rivers, so the kind of water that we can uh, imagine accessing. So that's, uh, it's quite limited. And I don't know if you can see the smallest of the three spheres on this map, but basically that's the water we have in fresh water and lakes. So the impression that I wanna leave you with here is that while some people regard water as a, an infinite resource, it's definitely a limited resource. And, and whether it's uh, an, an infinite resource is uh, certainly dependent on local circumstances. Um, regarding water uh, and climate change, I think up until about 2008, um, there was a lot of discussion on, on uh, okay, well, is there an impact and what is the extent of the impact? And even some of my water resource colleagues, some senior colleagues uh, questioned whether whether it was important or not. But I think this report by the IPCC that came out in 2008 uh, was very, very uh, useful for, for uh, kind of putting an end to that discussion. And it was clearly, um, it was clearly quite seminal because it underlined that uh, not only is uh, fresh water um, a vulnerable resource in terms of climate change, there is, uh, uh, it's also a resource that will be strongly impacted by climate change. Uh, interestingly enough, I think, uh, you know, in the, in the context of climate change, much of the discussions under the UNFCCC have been very focused on mitigation uh, up until quite recently, and adaptation is generally only played uh, lip service to. So, uh, even though this report is now seven years old, it's still, uh, it's still taking uh, time for, for, um, for the message to get through to a lot of people. In terms of the impacts on water resources, there are three main ones. Of course, uh, water quantity. It's often said that in the future, 
uh, dry places will get drier and wet will generally get wetter. Also in terms of water quality, uh, too little water in your river, for example, and uh, the pollutants in there will be uh, more concentrated. Um, and uh, too much water in terms of runoff can mean that more pollutants uh, get washed into the river. And of course, there's an impact on water availability in terms of the uh, uh, frequency and intensity of, uh, of rainfall and associated runoff. Um, some countries may find that they have the same annual rainfall, but of course, if all that rainfall comes in one day, then it, uh, it creates certain problems. Um, some of the uh, some of the impacts I'll pick up on just a few of these. Of course, uh, there's uh, an impact in coastal areas in terms of flooding and uh, the sea level rise, increased salinity of groundwater, and uh, associated uh, land use and planning challenges. Uh, in terms of agriculture and uh, forestry, there are of course uh, changes in uh, the types of crops and trees that will grow. And, um, and also associated uh, required changes in farming practices if we're able to uh, adapt. Human health issues are of course uh, well documented. And uh, just moving down, uh, yeah, energy production, that's quite an interesting one. Um, not a lot of people know that uh, or are aware of the, uh, the um, great reliance on energy production uh, on water resources. Uh, and not just uh, for hydropower plants, which of course require the right amount of water to be there at the right time. In, um, in more developing countries, um, traditional thermal uh, power plants require up to 39% uh, uh, of the total water abstractions um, uh, for, for their use in cooling. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, uh, more livelihoods-oriented uh, issues, such as those related to uh, fishing and, of course, the uh, impacts on the environment, which we rely on for our supplies. Yeah, I'm sorry, this slide here is a little bit difficult to read, but what, what we have down the, uh, the um, left-hand side are uh, some key drivers. And along the top, we have their impacts, the trends in these drivers, and uh, the impacts of climate change on the driver. And the basic message that uh, I want to uh, leave you with uh, with this slide is that climate change is, of course, just one of a range of drivers which uh, affect your countries. And, um, and, and other key drivers include, of course, population growth, uh, migration, and economic development and the challenges that come with those. Climate change is quite important because it has an impact on, on uh, most of the drivers and often accelerates their impacts. And the relative importance of climate change compared to the other drivers is, of course, uh, dependent on the local situation. In terms of the local situation, what I've done here is I've pulled some data from uh, uh, some national surveys from your countries. This data is from 2012. If your countries are, are not on this list, that's because they didn't respond to the survey. But there are a few things to, um, to, to pick up on uh, in, uh, in this figure. The first is uh, that, yeah, the countries were asked whether in the past 20 years that um, they had seen, uh, um, to what degree they had seen a change in the importance of, of climate change and water resources. And of course, there's a, a, a general trend in the response to say that there's, uh, uh, it's, it's generally increased quite a lot. And then, the, of course, the water managers, if we look over on the left-hand side, they were asked, OK, well, what priority do you give climate change in your countries in terms of managing water resources? And the responses from your water managers, and these are water managers from, from the government, from the ministries with, uh, with the key responsibilities for water resources, generally gave this uh, a high um, priority uh, rate. In terms of responding um, 
in, uh, for adaptation and uh, climate change and water resources, there are a number of key steps that uh, countries often take, of course, uh, beginning by understanding the situation uh, better, than, uh, better than we do today, trying to integrate planning and practices within and between sectors, so, um, you know, balancing water uses between uh, uh, the various users, be it agriculture, energy, domestic users, and so on. Increasing the efficiency of wa water use, this is doing more with less, recycling, avoiding pollution so the resource can be used uh, by others. Uh, perhaps looking at uh, diversification in um, technologies used and practices, this could be, um, this could be agri uh, in terms of agricultural practices, energy practices, practices within the home, for example, or uh, at a more extreme level, relocating people and uh, operations. What I've got on the next two slides are just some examples of, uh, if you were to get more operational, of, uh, uh, of some actions that countries typically take. So, you know, in terms of gaining a better, more, uh, a better understanding of the situation, the first one is all about mapping uh, the coastal hazards and developing emergency responses. Um, which many countries do. Uh, I think Bangladesh is, is probably uh, a good example there, but there are many, many others. Uh, restoring natural stor uh, storm surge buffers and incorporating climate change into coastal habitat restoration plans. There are a lot of examples there. For example, uh, at the moment, uh, my colleagues are working with the Cambodian government to restore mangrove uh, buffer regions on the coast. And uh, more obvious things like building uh, and repairing seawall uh, protection. Uh, modifying building codes. This is typically in more developed countries. Um, so, they, uh, so what's built is able to withstand higher water levels. Expanding setbacks um, from, from the coast. So this is uh, being introduced in uh, a number of places in India and uh, Sri Lanka, particularly in tourist areas where people have begun to build down uh, to the waterline and sometimes out into the sea. Um, upgrading and redesigning infrastructure. That's something I'm sure many of you have, have heard about before. And um, quite importantly, evaluating drinking water supplies with respect to climate change. So, you know, is your... Uh, is your, um, so are your sources of water going to be infected by salinity in the future? Are your sources of water going to be sufficient to suit your needs in the future, or do you have to look for alternative ones? In terms of uh, more inland uh, option examples, um, what, we, what we see more and more now is uh, combining uh, climate and hydrological models to get better... Uh, predictions of future scenarios. Um, we've been doing quite a lot of work in the, in the Nile region on that ourselves. Um, building climate change into plans, that's mainstreaming climate change into various plans. I've talked about practices already. I've talked about uh, supply augmentation. This is basically um, increasing your, uh, your uh, sources of water, so that might involve uh, uh, finding alternative supplies or building uh, dams and reservoirs. Um, and of course, I won't take you through them all, but basically uh, there's some ideas here. Uh, going back to this, uh, this survey, I've included a few uh, details here from that survey, and what we can what we asked these water managers is, uh, do you take climate change into consideration in your plans and, and to what extent is, climate, uh, is water taken into consideration in your uh, climate change plans? And uh, I suppose one could say that uh, climate change is considered more in the water resource management programs than in the, in the climate change plans. But, um, despite the impacts of climate change on water resources management. But I think more interestingly, if again, if we look on the left-hand side, we can see that uh, while there are 
programs and plans in your countries, and this is generally recognized as an issue, I think we can agree on that, um, then the plans and programs are, are not being implemented or haven't been implemented at the time of this uh, survey. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's probably a case for, uh, that's true for many countries that, yes, a lot of the paperwork is there, but action on the ground isn't being taken for various good reasons. And some of these reasons, which could be uh, um, reformulated perhaps to barriers, are uh, a lack of adaptive capacity. And these, uh, these um, variables or barriers or issues that I've included here are true not just for water, but of course for all kinds of uh, adaptation. And that's uh, due to a lack of uh, uh, economic resources, the right human resources, uh, access to information and, and the skills required to manipulate that information, technologies, institutional structures, infrastructure, of course, and, and the necessary political will to back up the, the plans and required actions. These are very, very typical barriers in, in developing countries. In terms of water, um, and, and climate change and preparing these INDCs, if you're to uh, begin your process by looking at, well, what, what has already been made, where is the information available on, on water and climate change, what we have here is a list of some examples of where you could uh, begin to look. Um, I believe you'll be getting a copy of the, the presentation later, so in the in view of time, I'm not going to go through those, but I would like to say a couple of words about the Sustainable Development Goals, which uh, uh, one of my colleagues has uh, previously mentioned briefly. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are um, involved in the Sustainable Development Goals or know about them, but basically they are the successors to the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, and they're due to run from the end of this year in September up until 2030. In the context of our work, there are many um, interesting goals which are currently being negotiated, but two in particular are, are, I'd just like to highlight. Um, one, if we, uh, if we go to goal 13, is this uh, where it mentions taking urgent action to com combat climate change and its impact. And in terms of uh, my personal area of interest and, and what I hope is an area of uh, interest for you. This is all to do with uh, water resources management and uh, use and, uh, and sanitation. Goal six. In terms of goal six in particular, which is my focus area, this, uh, this will cover um, uh, drinking water, sanitation, water quality issues, uh, water efficiency issues, improved and integrated management, and uh, attention to ecosystems. In terms of the way ahead, the um, yeah. in terms of the way ahead, these goals and the associated targets will be uh, finalised and agreed upon between our respective countries uh, in September of this year, and uh, the goals will be applicable to both developing and developed countries. Um, there's a lot more I could say about that, but what I've uh, included here is a link to, uh, to quite an interesting recent report by, uh, by CARE, and they have analyzed how um, the UNFCCC and post-2015 uh, development processes, these SDGs and the processes surrounding the SDGs can complement each other and support the desired uh, outcomes. So you'll have the link there when you get the, uh, when you get the presentation, and I'd encourage you to, to please have a look at that. Uh, just to wrap up, I have a few uh, key messages which, which basically summarize the, the main points uh, of the presentation. Uh, climate change uh, impacts water resources, which of course seriously impact development. And here we're not just talking about uh, domestic water supply, we're talking about water for industry, water for agriculture. Um, etc. Um, climate change is regarded as a high priority driver by water managers within your countries. So uh, 
so or even though drivers vary between countries, your water managers say that this is a major issue. Uh, responses to challenge, challenges are tried and tested. They're all out there. We, we know what to do. We know what action needs to be taken. You even have the plans in many cases. Okay, some plans, in some instances, plans will need to be revised, but um, actions aren't being implemented in, in your countries. Um, these INDCs are an opportunity uh, to make progress on adaptation and water challenges. And of course, um, my concluding message is that I would strongly encourage you to include water resources as a key component in your uh, INDCs. Uh, I'd like to conclude by saying thank you and, uh, and giving you my contact details up here. Uh, I welcome any of you who have any uh, uh, questions or follow-up issues that you'd like to take up with me to, to please just drop me an email and, uh, and I'd be happy to discuss with you. Thank you.